so much. Welcome, welcome everyone. I can see. I can see that more people are joining in. Welcome. So, so today um, we'll be talking about business. So everybody should pay undivided attention to this particular session. Hopefully, we're all going to take back home valuable um, lessons uh, to implement in our lives. Um, so uh, can we start sharing the screen, please? Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Tumsia, and um, I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Famalat, and I will be facilitating the session for today. Okay. So we promised to start on time. Uh, make sure we stay um, we stay on the time allotted for each of uh, the program on the agenda. Um, okay, uh, can we have the slide on the uh, slideshow mode, uh, mode and then we can just um, start. Thank you. <laughs> Can we have it uh, on a slideshow move, please? The screen is still partly full. Oh. All right, this is better. And uh, thank you. So welcome to yet another session of um, our teleeducation um, series, uh, Project uh, Tecla. And today's topic is um, A to Z um, about um, profitability of a veterinary business. And I promise you value today, um, so much value. And I am rest assured of that because of the caliber of uh, of experts we have today who will be taking us through what we need to start and not only start, but um, run and sustain a profitable veterinary business. So let me take us through the agenda so we're all uh, conversant with what, what's going to happen, what's, uh, what we're going to be having today. So can I have the agenda? Okay, so um, introductions just for five minutes or less. Uh, and then a brief about Farm a lot. Uh, then also a brief about um, the project itself, Tech Lab which uh, stands for Education for Clinicians and Leaders in Africa um, by uh, our team uh, partners, uh, MDOC. And then we're going to be having a pre-quiz. Uh, so a pre-quiz basically are just some questions extracted from the presentation uh, that will be administered before the presentation. And then after the presentation, just to help us um, measure the knowledge gained and shared during the presentation. And then we're going to be having the presentation given by Dr. Abibola Oshin uh, for 15 minutes. And then we're going to have an uh, open discussion for 40 minutes. So this is the main part. This is where we're going to be learning a lot. And then we're also going to be taking back home our expert um, recommendation on the topic. We'll have a post quiz and then also some announcements, summarization, and then we'll call it a day. So we promise to make this as exciting and insightful and interactive above all as possible. So the next slide. Um, so this is a slide showing uh, logo of some of our partners. Um, we have MDOC, we have Making More Health, we have Boringa Inglaham, and then we have uh, Ashuka Africa. Uh, thank you, next slide please. So, uh, these are the four pillars of uh, the ECHO model. So we're using uh, video conference technology to leverage scarce healthcare resources, um, specialists sharing best practice, practices with colleagues, case-based learning and continuous monitoring of program outcomes. So these are the pillars um, holding the ECHO model. So this is what the ECHO model is all about. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I mentioned Project Tecla at the beginning of my introduction. So Project Tecla Africa leverages the ECHO model. Um, we collect registration, participation, questions and answers, chat comments, and pull responses for our programs. 
your individual data will be kept, um, kept confidential and handled by authorized personnel. This data may be used for reports, maps, communications, surveys, quality assurance, evaluation, research, and also to inform new initiatives. Um, the session is being recorded for your information and we'll also be sharing a PDF version of the slides after the session. Next slide, please. And uh, these are just um, some few tips to make sure you have, you enjoy the session. Uh, please have your camera on. We love to see your beautiful faces. And then the facilitator will unmute you when you need to speak. And please make sure you use the raised hand feature in the Zoom when you want to speak. Kindly, kindly utilize the chat function for any questions we have people uh, um, specifically uh, designated to extract your questions and comments. Thank you. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, based on the agenda, a uh, brief about Farmer Lat. So um, I will be doing that social uh, enterprise. And um, all we just want to do, what you can see on the screen is to enable easy access to affordable animal health care in underdeserved, uh, underserved communities in Africa. And by doing this, we're encouraging um, peer to peer interactions at different levels and then knowledge shared at different levels. And this is one of, uh, this is one of the things we do. We have the FamaLat uh, business. We have the FamaLat Impact Initiative. We have uh, FamaLat Radio. And um, so these are all components which we're using to make sure that um, stakeholders in animal health care are able to collaborate and um, at the end of the day, enable easy access to affordable animal health care. So FamaLat is here to, uh, to partner, to collaborate, and just to make sure that the we have that animal health space we dream, we dream of. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have the next um, slide uh, where um, the MDOC team will give us a brief of our project, Tecla. Um, Adora, over to you. Um, Adora, can you hear me? So let's just um, give a few seconds and see if she comes up. Okay, can we unmute Adora, please? This Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, we can Hello, hear you, Adora. Hello, everyone. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon and uh, welcome to the session today. I will be very quick. My name is Adora Odukwe, and I work as a senior manager with MDOC. Uh, just to give a very brief um, history of Project Tecla, um, the goal of Project Tecla is to pretty much provide capacity building opportunities um, for healthcare professionals, both within human health and now extended to animal health. Um, this is to help um, support or address the issues around suboptimal training opportunities that exist within our healthcare system. But also uh, both human health and animal health, but also to contribute to achieving um, the sustainable development goals. And so we're happy to partner with um, the Making More Health um, family, which is an initiative by Boringa Inglerheim and Ashoka, as well as our lovely partners here at Farm Alerts, who are doing absolutely wonderful work um, within the animal health space. So um, I'm looking forward to having a wonderful time today. I want to learn, I have my pen and my paper, to learn all that there is about the business um, of animal health. Great to be here. Um, have a wonderful time with us. Thank you. Thank you, Adora. Adora is always doing this exceptionally well. <laughs> Thank you. And need I say, um, Farmalat is actually the first to leverage the ECHO model in the entire animal health space. So this is a big one for us. Um, okay. Thank you, Adora. Uh, the next slide, please. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, 
So we're going to be having the pre-quiz, as I stated earlier, we'll have the pre-quiz and then I'll introduce our hub experts and we can get down to the presentation um, as quick as possible. So can we have the poll up? So uh, this is just, as I stated earlier, when I was introducing the, uh, the agenda. So this is um, just a few questions, um, which we're, we encourage you to please um, answer. They're just simple questions and um, they're answered based on anonymity. So it's not going to show anybody's name or anybody's um, score. It's just going to help us gain, uh, it's going to help us gauge uh, knowledge before and after this particular session. So I implore you all to please it up on your screen. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we have about hundred people in the room and just one person has answered. So please, yes, more people are coming up. Thank you very much. Keep the answers coming. It's just to help us. So um, I'll, I'll kindly say, uh, you answer the question just to help us um, with, uh, so we know exactly what we're doing and how to serve you better next time. So. Uh, thank you very much. I have nine people, 30% participation. We can do more. Um, we're just going to have this for three minutes. And move to the main. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's from my end, but the poll, uh, the poll is down. It's still up. Okay. 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 So once it's um, three minutes, we're taking down the poll and um, so we're almost um, one minute out. So I implore you to please answer the questions. They're just simple questions, simple, basic questions. More people are joining in, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, okay, so let's just keep answering uh, and the poll will be down in the next few uh, seconds. We have about 70%. Keep the answers coming, keep the answers coming. Thank you, thank you. We now have 80%. Keep the answers coming. We have 83%. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Eighty-six percent. This is impressive, highly, highly impressive. So we should be having the poll down any moment from now. 88%. Okay, now I'm impressed. Thank you. 90%. All <laughs> right, thank you. So we're going to be taking the same question after the session. Okay, so I think we can take the poll down. Can we have the poll down? Okay, 
Um, next slide, please. Can we have the poll down? Can you hear me? The polls okay. are down. Um, all right, so thank you so much for answering the questions. We had a good um, number of um, people participate. That's encouraging. So today, as I said, um, we're having a group of um, exceptionally, um, would I say successful business owners within and outside Nigeria, so it's a mix of both. Um, so I assure you of quality um, knowledge and strategies <laughs> to establish your own business. So we're having Dr. Abimbola Oshin, who is a small animal specialist and a business owner in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. So he has successfully established a business in the USA. So you know that you're getting good value. So he's part of He's one of our hub experts today, and um, he will be giving the um, uh, presentation on the topic. And then we also have, next slide please, we also have um, Dr. Gani Enahoro, who is the CEO of Garo Vet Animal Hospital, Worry, Delta State. I don't need to say much about Dr. I don't need to say much about Dr. Ghani. We all know it's a household name. I may be saying that. And he's presently the chairman of continuing education committee um, of the Council of Nigeria. He has a certificate in entrepreneurship from Harvard Business School. So these are the caliber of people we're having today. Um, Dr. Ghani, thank you so much. Dr. Abibola Oshi, thank you for joining. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, permit me to say this. I'm just not being uh, gender biased or anything, but Dr. Chinasa, uh, oh my God. Uh, like, I don't know if, if you're opportuned to be in Abuja, make sure, please make out time to pay a visit to her facility and you will understand my energy at this point. When I called her name, she has successfully established an animal, an animal hospital, not a clinic, and a pet smart, state of the art, I must say. Dr. China said, thank you so much for being here with us. And um, we're, we're happy to learn from you. Hopefully we have, we get a hold of this uh, veterinary business. Thank you all so much much our hub experts for uh, joining today. Um, so let's uh, have the presentation. And Dr. Abibola Oshin, you have uh, 15 minutes to uh, give us your presentation on the topic for today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Abibola Oshin. Um, hello, Dr. Abimbala Oshin. Okay, can we unmute him, please? Hi, Dr. Bimbal. I think it there might be some audio issues yeah, from your end. Now. We can hear him. Yeah. Can you hear me? Wow. Yes. Yes, we can. You can hear me now? Yes, sir. 
Good, thank you very much. So, um, let's see. So the topic today is uh, talking about the A to Z of um, profitable veterinary business. And um, it sounds very simple, um, <laughs> so that's A to Z. I, I remember seeing the topic when um, Dr. Hayode sent it to me and I was like, it's not A to Z, it's A to Z, then zero to nine, then if you can just imagine, you know, the, um, the face of the scientific calculator, all of those functions and everything is included. But I'll try to at least get us started so we can have a robust um, discussion at the end of the day. So um, what um, I want to share, I think, is, is pertinent also to me because I remember trying to move to Atlanta when I made up my mind with my family that we're going to settle in Atlanta. And, um, you know, I tried to find a job. There were not very many specialist hospitals and they were not hiring. And I remember being a professional. I mean, it's been inculcated into me, even right from um, the university days in Nigeria, that you don't always have to look for a job. As a professional, you can create a job. And so that was one of the motivation for me to, um, join with my partner to create our own hospital. So thereby providing not only employment for myself, which I could not find, but also employment for other doctors and, and other professionals and staff. So, so this is pertinent to know that um, not all of us can get a government job, not, of, not all of us can be employed by practices out there, but maybe with some knowledge, and understanding, we can also start our own um, practice. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, when we talk about um, veterinary practices, I'm not talking about you know what we just normally call PP in Nigeria, where you just take your um, your stethoscope and some needles and and just help some family friends out or maybe somebody who knows you're a doctor uh, and you know just treat their animals that's that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about really going out there and establishing your business Remember the topic is A to Z of a veterinary business. So what is a business? A business is actually an entity that is engaged in commercial, industrial, or professional activities. For you to be a business in Nigeria, you need to be registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission. Um, there is actually a law that governs um, businesses in Nigeria and I think that that's called the Company and Allied Matters um, Act. So most people who are going to go into business, you need to know about that. Uh, there are different kinds of businesses that you can establish. I think the easiest one is the business name. So you, you can get a business name and just be a sole proprietor, but partnership, or you can form a company that um, protects you. Because with a business name and sole proprietor, you're really not protected. They'll tell you what's best for you and uh, what you can uh, and the best way to start a business. So that's the business. You can go to the next slide. The next slide, I was just going to emphasize what is a veterinary business because those are about here. I think it's any kind of business that involves anything that has to do with the maintenance of animal health, you know, treatment and diseases, and also maybe even to protect it and prevent problems. So in, in my, in looking at this, I'm really thinking uh, clinical practices, which could be large animal, small animal, exotics, mixed, all of that. Even laboratory services, uh, uh, veterinary services, and also animal health business. And the animal health business, everybody knows a lot about that. That's when you sell, you know, supplies 
paper and things like that. So these are all legitimate veterinary business. Now, there's nothing stopping a veterinarian from having other businesses that are not veterinary. So, so don't be limited in your thinking. But when we talk about veterinary business, those are the kind of things we're talking about. So uh, we can go to the next slide. So our topic today is to really talk about profitable veterinary business. So what is a profit? The profit is that money that you make after you've paid all your expenses. One of the things I like to emphasize is that when you work in your own business, you need to get paid. And the money that you pay yourself is actually not profit. So you have to look at profit as, you know, if your business employs you, employs other people, whatever you have at the end of the day, that is profit. Now, profit is not a bad word. Um, as professionals, especially we that are in the healthcare, caring, you know, um, service industry, like veterinary medicine, some people would like to guilt you and say, you know, doctor, is it all about the money? You're supposed to help my dog that is sick. Or you're supposed to um, know that this dog is dying and uh, nothing, nobody has any money. Can't you just do it for free? So um, veterinary medicine, unfortunately, as a business, is about the money. Because if you don't have money, then your business, you will go out of business very, very soon. In fact, there are statistics in the US um, that you know, most um, of all businesses that are started, about 20% of them pack up within the first year. And only about 45% um, of them make it past 10 years. So the number for veterinary business is lower than that so veterinary business is one of the most stable businesses to say is profit is not a bad thing that is the reason you're doing the business um and it is really the aim of the activities that you do as a business so there are businesses that are non-profit so the government is not supposed to be a profitable business you know there are maybe churches that are not supposed to be profitable profitable business associations like um, NVMA is not a profitable business. You see, all of these are non-profit. Um, they, they, the money they make, they put it back into the, uh, into the business. But as a veterinarian, if you start a business, the profit, you can take that, you can do whatever you want with it. You can take it out, you can put it back into the business. It's a profitable business. So let's go to the next slide. So now, what are the requirements or the A to Z, if you want to put it? The first thing that I want to, I think, um, emphasize is when you look at economics, and all of us remember the factors of production, by starting a business, what you're becoming is becoming an entrepreneur. Okay, the entrepreneur is that person that brings all the other factors of production, um, the land, the labor, and the capital, and makes magic with it and starts a business, employs other people, solve people's problem, which is what businesses really do, you know, but with services or products. And so as a person, that is where the first A to Z is. There's so many things that you need to be. And um, those are things that we can also talk about in the discussion. I did put some of it out in that slide. You need to have passion. You need to be passionate about what you're doing. You need to have knowledge about what you so graduate today and start a business tomorrow and you don't even know what you're doing, then that business is likely to fail. So be a competent professional, know that you have something to offer, identify what's going on, identify what you can improve, be passionate about it. You have to be somebody who is creative because there's nothing you're going to do that has not been tried by other people. So how are you going to do it in a way that is going to guarantee success for you? You know, you have to um, um, be ready to take risks because business is risk. You can get profit and you can get loss. Um, you have to be somebody who, who knows how to network. You know, there's just so many things. Um, you have to be adaptable to whatever is going on in the society. But like I said, we, we can come and talk about you as a person all the things that you have to be to run a successful business. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so, so that is um, 
that is talking about you. But, but that's not all that it takes to be a business in business. If you have all of those qualities that people look at you, you've been doing business since you were in, maybe you were in five years old, you've been around business people, then, then for a veterinary business, what are the requirements to make it successful? Um, the first thing is you need to be able to create and share a vision, okay, for your business. You need to know what business am I doing? Am I trying to be a veterinary clinic? Am I trying to be a, um, to service the poultry industry? Am I trying to service the pig industry? Because, oh my God, maybe there's not a lot of porcine vet out there and that seems to be a passion of yours. And therefore you see, and you, you, you can create a vision. Are you trying to become a specialist? There's, there's a service you want. You want x-rays, but you cannot find x-rays. Nobody can find x-rays. And so you're like, oh, maybe I'm going to start a radiology service so I can service other people, you know, so you can become a specialist. So you, you need to be able to create that vision and be able to articulate it. The second requirement is that you need to identify a market. There's no need having a vision, knowing what you want to do, but there's no market for it. And because that market is going to determine where the your business succeeds. So um, in that, I, I can give an example. I mean, if you live in a majority Muslim area and your vision is to, is to have um, a, um, a porcine practice, you, you know there's no market there, you may have to move. Or uh, if you decide, oh, I want to live in a VI, but I, I, I really want to service the, um, the, the bovine industry then you're not going to be living in VI. You're going to be moving somewhere where there's lots and lots of um, markets for you to, to try. Um, the other requirement is financing. So that, that's the business takes money. They say it takes money to make money. So you need to make sure you have enough finances, not only to get your business going, but also to sustain the business, especially through the first couple of years. Um, hopefully the first couple of months because veterinary businesses, if run right, um, should really be cash flow positive as soon as possible. So where is that financing going to come from? You need to know about, you know, do you have to borrow? Um, is this money that um, you have already saved? Are you going to go into partnership with other people so that you can all pull your finances together? So, so that's a requirement. And the final requirement I put there is that you need to know how to build a team. Um, veterinary practice or veterinary business is not something you can do by yourself. Um, you're gonna have to pull other people in, either as partners, either as um, um, employees, either as um, even, even other businesses, either as independent professionals or contractors. So you, you, you need to be able to build a team. So those are requirements for running a successful business. Next slide, please. So how do you know that you have those requirements? The best way to demonstrate you have those requirements when you're starting a, a practice is actually to write a business plan, okay? Um, writing it down is very important. Uh, most of us know the business that we want to do. We have all this information, it's in our head but we have not written it down, okay? Uh, and so there is really no proof. The best thing is to write it down, to share it with people that you um, respect, you know, people that are not gonna steal your ideas, but, but that will improve on them and, and help you out. So you, either your mentors, and they don't have to be veterinary people. Um, people who know business will recognize any business of anywhere and they can put holes in your business plan and help you get it better. So it's just like being practicing veterinary medicine. We are all told to write, taught how to write our medical records and update them. If you're treating animals, you're writing medical record, um, but you're not writing anything down, then there's really nothing to show your thought process, what you've done. It's the same thing with uh, business. So what's a business plan? Like I said, one of the things that you need was the, to have a vision. So you need to write the purpose of your business. What is this business for? This business is being created to service the pet industry in Ojojo. 
um, because um, uh, and this is what we plan to do. We plan to provide um, um, uh, to to manage our patients so that they don't get sick. We're going to provide preventive health care. We're going to treat um, sick animals, and we're going to also, you know, whatever your vision is, uh, you should be able to say the purpose. Then you need to be able to do a market analysis. Remember, we said market, defining the market, you need to know how, who are your competitors? Who are the people that are already doing this? So, um, oh, actually, that's, that's the next one. When you talk about market, you're talking about how big is the market? How many dog owners are out there? How many cat owners? If that's what you want to do, if you want to do pig, how many piggeries are in the area? You know, what is the size of the market? Yeah, if, for example, you live in an area where, um, I'll take Lagos State, for example, there are 20 million people there. And the average people, the, the average size of the family is maybe about five. So you know that that tells you that there are about maybe 4 million families there, and maybe 10% of the families have dogs. So you have 400,000 people that have dogs. Then you know how the average money that people spend to be able to survive with them. I'm sure maybe be the owner that wants to trip to the vet clinic. So you have to educate them. You have to show them that it is better for them to, to do that than, than to risk losing the animal or wasting money. So you have to analyze your condition and know that. Then you need to be able to know all the personnel that you're going to business with. You need to know everybody that you're starting with. You need to write your financials down. Don't just say, yeah, I'm going to borrow money from this person. I'm going to borrow money from this back. Write it down. This is how much money I'm getting from this source. This is how much I have in... Um, in savings, and this is how much I have um, um, from another source. They need to say, okay, based this, uh, this is what I hope, I, what I think I will make in the first one year. This is what I think I will um, incur in terms of buying supplies, paying rent, paying for my internet, electricity generator. You know, you have to get down to that level. This is how much salary I hope to pay myself. So you can see if you have enough if this will work before you start. If, for example, it's not going to work, then you can tweak your plan. I know you either have to borrow more money or find ways to reduce your expenses so that um, at least you give yourself the best chance to survive. Uh, and then finally, when you write a business plan, you should be able to summarize all of that in, in, in a very, in, at least within a page so that you can share with people and, and be able to, pitch it to people that are going to borrow you money, that are going to work for you, that are going to work with you. Even your family members that are like, hmm, I think you need to go and look for a job. You can show them your business plan and say, this is going to work and it can help you make it better. So let's go to the next slide. So now that we've talked about, um, I think there's a slide before this. Unless, we, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So, uh, um, so, You've had your business plan. Um, we talked about the qualities that you need to have. Now, this is talking directly to veterinarians. As veterinarians, there are some knowledge that we don't have that was not incorporated in our training. Uh, but that is essential if you want to uh, earn a business uh, or at least um, run a successful business. I have divided this into this first section. So you need to know about um, accounting. A lot of us don't know about the double entry process. These are things that you can write down and go and find out about or we can talk about um, to, um, once, um, once I quickly run this off. You know, you need to know about um, profit and loss. You need to know about the accounting equation that says that every asset that you have um, either belongs to somebody else or belongs to you. So assets is equal to liability and equity. And liability comes first. You know, you need to understand all of that. You need to understand um, um, how the, all the different transactions 
that you make, you need to be able to classify them. Is this, a, is this an investment? Is this an income? Is this um, a liability? Is this an expense? You know, you need to start learning those kind of language if you really want to succeed. Okay, you need to um, uh, be able to, um, uh, what do you call it? Anyway, let, let me not belabor accounts because I know that some people may start getting um, fearful and say, oh no, I have to go back to school. No, you don't have to go back to school for all of it. Some people went back to school. I went back to school to learn a lot of these concepts, but you don't have to. You can pick them up. You can go for continuing education um, like this. You can have one that is focused on accounts and things like that. Another thing you need to learn about is financing. When you talk about financing, the most important thing is the time value of money. You need to know that money is valuable and you need to understand how um, interest and, and money grows and, and investment and things like that. They're not very, they, they look like big topics. They're not scary, they look big, but you need to, you need to learn them. You need to know about marketing um, um, and then you need to know about business strategy. Business strategy just talks about how do you want your, to position your business? Are you going to be the cheapest person? Uh, are you going to go for cost? Are you going to try to differentiate yourself and become a specialist? Are you going to just cater to the rich people? Are you go, what strategy are you going to use to try to, to survive? Um, human resources talks about managing your employees. So that's another thing that you need to learn how to do. So the, these are knowledges that you need to learn. Now I'm going to round up with the last um, slide. So that slide um, is just a picture that um, my dad had in his um, office. Uh, my dad was a business, or he's a businessman. I think he's retired now, so maybe I can use both. But, but he had this picture that was right over his desk. And, and I stared at that picture, I must say, maybe since I've been like six, seven, eight years old, up until I left for <laughs> I left for the university. And I used to always look at those people and say, wow, you know, just just look at them every day. But now that I'm doing I'm running my own business, it is really one of the um, one of the foundation for a successful business is that you always make sure that you get your money. You know, in, in our practice, we don't do anything unless the owner pays up front. We don't bill people, we don't collect later. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that helps you to keep you um, liquid, to keep your business running. They say cash flow is the oil that makes the business run. So, so that would be one of the things I would say. It is better for you to stay at home and do nothing than for you to go out and do something on credit. Because if you never get that money, now you're in debt too, because the people that you got it from to perform that service, they're not going to understand that other people owe you. They're going to come after you. So um, I think I'm going to end there so I can give enough time if I haven't taken everything yet, so we can have a very robust discussion. Thank you very much. Oh, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abibola. Um, okay. A message just popping now, and I think uh, on a lighter note, there is this um, song now that says, "Collect your money." So please keep tab of that. Don't don't just just collect your money. There's really no no two ways about it. We've seen how credit has ruined businesses that had so much plan, but you know, family, friends, and people just come take things on credit, and then before you know it, that's just the end. Thank you so much, Dr. People. I learned a lot personally. I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure everybody in the room was able to get value from your presentation. So I will give um, Dr. Ghani three minutes, you know, to say something and then we'll move to uh, Dr. China Asa for another three minutes too. And then we can <clears throat> dive into the discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, let me thank uh, uh, Bimbo for a very fantastic presentation within a short time. I would like to start on that is last slide. Uh, which uh, was turned into a song of collect your money. Uh, in reality, in reality, sometimes it is difficult for us to apply all those very hard principles. There are some people 
out of uh, relationship, they would have become like uh, uh, family members to us. I have always advocated that, that we must separate our businesses from friendship. It's difficult, but we should try. Some of the clients want to make you a family friend. No, <laughs> there must be a line drawn. But if you are choosing to be uh, careless, to be drawn in, to have allowed some clients to make you a family friend, then it is difficult not to give credit at some point. But you can see the sync song in Nigeria now. It's about borrowing is not a problem, provided that GDP is bigger than the money we have borrowed. That's what the finance minister will tell us. The GDP ratio to, to, to loan is not bad. I see GDP is going to pay back our loan. <laughs> It's our income, our revenues that we pay back our loan. So we must also be definitive in our businesses that where we have given the opportunities for some people to have taken us into that family relationship that we give you some credit facilities, we must draw a line and know beyond what and beyond where must we no longer uh, accept such credit facilities. So let us have that kind of uh, understanding that sometimes it might be difficult for us not to disobey principles, some of the principles of businesses we are talking about. I can talk again later on. Maybe I should allow um, Chima and Sa to say something now. Thank you. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Gani. I love that part, be definitive. Um, so we're going to take um, Dr. Chinasa for another three minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Dr. Chinasa, over to you. Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about the aspect of uh, market analysis. Um, you, like Dr. Bimbo said, you actually have to analyze your market. You need to position yourself, and you also need to position yourself where your clientele would be. That's a very, very important aspect of business. For example, he also, he mentioned about someone running a pig, uh, sorry, uh, a practice catering for pigs and uh, positioning himself where you have a lot of Muslims and you know Muslims don't have, uh, don't take uh, pork. For me, I, at the early stage of my business, I'm gonna use a personal example. I, my business location was in the outskirts of Abuja. Uh, somewhere called in Lube, for those of us conversant with Abuja. So now, uh, the area where I was, the buying capacity of people in that area didn't match up with what I had to offer. So I realized that, you know, Lube is an, is an area where people move in the morning and then most people walk in town. So you move out in the morning and you go to town. So nobody really had the time to bring their pets to the clinic. Now we were always having to go to the client's house to tr treat their pets and all. Then we had quite a number of issues there too. Then uh, I had to sit down and, you know, analyze and find out that, okay, what exactly is going on? And we had the website, we were uh, sending in pet products from Lube to town and everything. So I, I and some people would also come there to buy uh, products. But I realized that when they come, they don't come back. So the customer retention was really bad. I'm talking about for pet products, but for the clinical aspect, we have people within the Lube Axis who were patronizing us. Uh, I had to move to Ogarki in town because I realized that what I was offering, I needed to be closer to the people who would afford my market. Then I also want to talk about uh, strategy. You need to have a strategy when on how you're going to run your business. For me, I have that a niche for myself because when I started, I didn't really have the funds or the finance. So I had to sit down and say, okay, what can I do now with what I have? I started this mini importation with the little amount of money I had at that time. I went into accessories because I realized that most vet clinics will just have the normal regular stuff, which is the dog or cat food, um, uh, multivitamins, shampoo, and just a basic few stuff. So I, I was like, what can I offer that was different? So I realized that, okay, there were some people who, if you, if you have 
products like training pads, diapers, clothes for pets, and all other accessories. They were people who were looking for those things to buy. So I use that as a strategy to have a niche for myself in that uh, aspect. And that was what I was able to use to, you know, raise funds and then also fund the business. So I really, 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 and also the branding aspect. Sorry, I hope I'm not taking more than 30. Sorry, three minutes. Branding no, is also fine. very important. You know, branding maybe another extra two minutes. Okay. I enjoy, I'm enjoying what you're saying. <laughs> Okay, branding, uh, for branding, your brand identity has to be strong. Branding, uh, brand identity, they are the visible elements of your brand that will register in, in your client's uh, mind. So when people see, for example, when you see GT Bank, I don't know if you, if, if you see a GT Bank that is uh, being set up, probably when they've not put the logo, by looking at the design of the building, you already know it's a GT Bank because they have this cuboid uh, way of, designing their, their, um, their bank or, sorry, their bank branches. So uh, your brand identity and those three elements like your design, your logo and your color, they really, really need to stand out. So that when people see these things, they know that, okay, this is this uh, clinic. Your brand identity has to be strong. Ambience too is also very important. Uh, people need to walk into your clinic and see that you know you don't have the smell coming out from different areas. It's well arranged and all that. So there are just a lot of things that uh, are very very important when that you need to also put in mind when you're setting up your business. And this will play a key role in the profitability of the business. Thank you. I'm sorry for taking so much. Um, yeah, can I take? Right, Tina, sir, thank you very can much. I can I take two minutes more? Sir. Let me take two minutes more. Okay. I want to quickly say that when uh, Dr. Oshi was presenting the areas of education in businesses, he said we may not necessarily have to go to school again to go and learn new things uh, that has to do with businesses. Let me very strongly recommend that we need to go to school where necessary to be able to learn some of these things again. There is no experience, no matter how native that experience looks today, that can match the ideas and the knowledge that we will receive when we go for these short courses. They may not necessarily have to be courses to come us to be accountants. They don't have to be courses that will make us become lawyers that we must have a structured exposure to some causes and we will see the difference. Let me tamper with the popular saying that uh, maybe uh, we are not running with a competitive market. You can have a, a monopoly within a competitive market. You can have a monopoly by creating that difference which the next competitor does not have. And that you can get only through schooling, only through exposure to structured education. So I strongly would recommend that. Uh, a lot of courses exist today. You have certificates for them that you don't need, you don't need to even go and stay in the school to do that. But very important, we need to factor that into our curriculum, sorry, into our program as a business person. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um... We have questions um, coming in, so please do uh, utilize uh, the chat function. Drop your questions, drop your comments. We have people extracting them, and we'll make sure that, um, if not all, uh, but majority of those questions are answered. Um, because as I'm seeing this, we most likely be having a second part to this session. So, uh, Dr. Chinasa, I think um, this question I'll direct it to you, because you made a statement. Okay. You said when you wanted to start your business you said, you, you know, you were short of funds uh, for what you wanted to do, but you asked yourself, what can I do with what I have? I have two questions here. And one person said, um, what are the ways uh, one can source for startup funds? Here's heard say family and friends. What if you don't have family and friends to support you? And then another question too said, um, how do you access loans and grants? 
I, I want to be, I want us to be as practical as possible. We're in Nigeria and we have to find a way to navigate and survive. Um, accessing these loans are not very easy. We all know that. But Dr. Chinas has said something. She said, what can we do with what we have? So you can start somewhere. Dr. Chinas, please, can you uh, maybe tell, answer this particular question? So they said, ways to source for funds. How to do it? Okay, how to source for funds? Uh, there are different ways to source for funds. Just like you said, family and friends uh, is one of the ways you can source for funds. You can also team up with a partner to raise funds. Probably you have the expertise, you have the idea, and then you have someone who has the funds, more like an angel investor. Mm -hmm. So that person can come in. You can also um, source for funds. For me, like what I said earlier, I started this mini importation. I think the first set of goods I brought in, I, it wasn't up to like a hundred thousand there. I said then that was in 2017, thereabouts. So uh, I just bought a few items and then I started. And I realized that as I started selling them, people were buying, I put them in my store. You understand, even though my shelves were quite kind of a bit empty, but I realized that people were looking for it. I remember a particular white lady was looking for a carrier for her cat. She needed to travel with the cat. And then she wanted to travel with the cat in the cabin. Now, all what she was seeing in most of the places she had uh, visited were the normal carrier crates, the plastic ones. So I had the other one made with uh, this clue like material. So she had to do, she found us on Google My Business and then she came all, all the way down to Lube to get the carrier. She was like, oh, what are you guys doing here? You people are far from where you're supposed to be. So I realized that from that, that one of those things also made me realize that my market might not be in Lube. I needed to move down to town. So with little money, like for me, I, I actually register on a lot of courses, like that mini importation. I think I remember paying, was it someone was doing a course on Instagram? I think it was 3,000 or 4,000, I can't remember. I pay for a lot of courses. I do a lot, just like Dr. Organis said. We need to learn every month like this. I'm always learning something new because the moment you don't learn, you might not grow because you just remain at a static level. So I paid for one course on Instagram. I learned the basic on how to import things from China. And that was how I started with my small 100,000 era then. I got those products and then I started selling. And gradually, gradually, I started uh, importing more, more stuff. So uh, also for another way to raise funds, is the bank. Now, recently, most banks have, uh, I've only done the bank loan maybe like once or twice, but it's also another way. Uh, for women-owned businesses, some banks like uh, Zenit Bank and Access Bank, the ones that I know, uh, have a kind of a, a package for businesses. And then they, I think it's a CBN thing with the banks. So most of those loans have this single digit because the number of regular loans are from like 22, 23% interest. But those loans, you can maybe talk to a bank official. Those loans have like single digit, some are 9% and think 8%. But if you are getting a bank loan, you need to be able to calculate. Like, you know that, oh, I'm going to do this and this is how I'm going to pay back. Don't get a bank loan and without a, a strategy on how you're going to pay back. You understand? So I am from a business family. My both parents and my late mom, uh, my dad and my late mom were both business people. So I was raised in an environment of business where you have to go to the shop, you know, just like the typical Adam Barra people. So you have to go to the shop. So I understood from a little age, the whole buying and selling thing and how you were able to you know, sell your products, pay up the bank loan on time, you understand, and then keep running your business. So those are ways that you can, you can raise funds. But actually, no matter how small, uh, I just don't have the pictures here, but if, for people who knew me, my place in Lube was in the remote, like Lube village, it's, the, it's a village area. But I just made sure that I put 
you know, the little structures that I needed to do. I had to demarcate an area for clean for the clinic. I had like a small mini bathtub. And then I went myself to all these Panteka shops. I don't know if you know what it is, but like I literally went like the shelves because I wanted to minimize cost. I had to go to where the welder is. I would buy the iron. I'll tell them, okay, do this, do this like this. For printing my uh, complimentary cards and my clinic files, I went to a, an area in Abuja called uh, UTC because I was looking for, I didn't have the money to pay someone to do all that for me. Now I could tell someone, oh, print the files, do this, do that. But then I didn't have, so I had to get someone who would do the design for me. And then even my logo, my logo was designed by my brother's friend. Though he he's a brand expert, and uh, my brother had to speak to him because I said, "Yeah, I don't have money. I don't know how, but I needed a very good logo." So uh, he, my brother, had to speak to his friend to help me design the logo, and I gave him a very little token. So I looked for very minimal ways to start. Even the shelves I had, I like I said, I had to go to the market to do all that. So I I was able to you know, arrange my place, but I made sure that it was standard, even at that level that I was, because I realized that people will come in and they're like, oh, is this a vet clinic uh, in this place? You know, so it's how we present it. We, there, there's always a cheaper way to run something. That's my own uh, mantra. Like that's what I, I always feel that there's a cheaper way to do something, no matter how you think it is. If you really dig deep, there's always a cheaper way to do it. And then that way you can just start and from there you can fill up. Oh, and thank you so much. Topic, for I really, I would I, have, um, okay. I'm Continue. picking out a lot of things. I have my pen okay. and then my paper. So I'm facilitating and also taking it down a lot of things because I'm definitely not going to miss all of these things. Mm -hmm. So what can you do with what you have? That's a very important question. And if you listen to what Dr. Chinasa said, you just have to constantly keep thinking. You have to constantly keep looking. There is always a way out. There is always a way out. There is no dead lock. Like there is no dead end. That I, that I know. Especially now that the, the world is evolving at a very rapid pace. Like there is oh, people are waking up every day preferring solutions to problems. So that is what like that is what we need to do. We have to constantly keep thinking and looking. Uh, Dr. Gani, I will um, direct this next question to you. Uh, somebody said, what is the biggest hindrance to sourcing funds? And then what is the place of credibility or experience? Uh, Dr. Gani, I will, uh, this question is for you. Okay. Um, biggest hindrance to sourcing funds. Yeah, right. that's one question. And then he said, what is the place of credibility and experience? Let me disappoint the questioner that I will throw the question back to him that why does he have to source for fund? The truth of the matter is that what we need is like this. But what we want is like a gold post <laughs> in the business of veterinary medicine. What do we really need? What you need is the training we had in school. I'm talking from practical experience now, and I'm happy Dr. Chinasa is in discovery. Because whatever I may say now, some people will say that is old school, time, six years ago. I'm happy Dr. Kinasa is saying what we did in that ancestor long time ago is what she is doing now and she's doing very well already. You don't have that, don't have that mindset that you are going to source for fun, look for what do you need to do? That is what you need to find out. What do you need? And that is why I think sessions like this are very, very helpful and important because I am talking from personal experience now. I started my practice on the very day the personal parade of NYC ended. Six months before the personal parade, I already had a signboard rating. I had a house rented, a premises for practice, I begged, I negotiated with the landlord, and instead of taking three years rented for me, I paid for six months. I didn't need to beg anybody for money to do that. You know what? Look at the basket. I run 
tap water into a basket. Will it stay? No matter how fast the input or inlet of the water is, that basket, because it will be leaking, will drain all the water, you won't have anything in there. So most of the challenges we have is about how to know how to spend money. If you go and source for money and you don't know how to spend money, the money will just go like that as well. So we need to begin to learn how to spend money. Uh, riches does not just come because we have a heat. And that is challenge most of our talented guys have uh, in music, music industry, in football, talent football, and then they have a lot of big, big money. Many of them don't know how to spend money and the money will come in and get wasted. So we need to also, first of all, learn how do we spend money? How do we cut our appetite? I used to be a spend trick when I get to the supermarket. If I hold, you need to hold my hand because anything I see that, uh, that I, I have a function for, I pick <laughs> until I get to the pay point. And especially in these days of your POS or your ATM card, you just give them the ATM card and they pull your money from your account. That money, have you budgeted for it to spend it? Many of us have not. So we need to know how to spend money. That's number one. So that whenever you now have anything come in as an inlet or as an income, then you can now have a balancing out of what you have obtained as income and what you have expended as outlet. And that is the challenge. So let me disappoint the questioner that uh, uh, the idea of sources for fun. I can tell you every veterinarian has all he needs to be in veterinary business, every veterinarian upon graduation. Yes, I agree that we need to do a lot of tweaking to our curriculum to begin to tell people this in school. Secondly, on the issue of integrity, yes, it's all about the veterinary businesses alone. The young vets of today are lucky to be able to have places to even go and work or have a tutelage and get trained. And therefore, your integrity starts from there. If you have gone to practice with a senior colleague, you have a very high resource already. I know of some of those who work with me who till today are very free to call me and say, boss, I have a problem, I have an investment I want to make. Can you please support me? Those have money without credit, without bank interest given to them, which heightens or increases the profit margin at the end of the day. That is integrity. I also have some of my past veterinarians who worked with me, who even when they know they need that, they would not be able to call me. So integrity, very challenging. Very challenging, and that is why a lot of uh, the veterinarians today uh, hanging out there are unable to go back to benefit the investment they would have already originally made. I don't know, I hope that answers the question for now. I also want to add um, something. Yeah. Okay. okay, can I talk? Okay. Uh, also, uh, just like what Dr. Danny said, you don't need to spend so much money. You need to reduce your spending. One of the things I did, like I said earlier too, is that, uh, like I said, there, there's always a cheaper way to do something. When I was coming up, I would go to all the street stores to get furniture that are still good. There are some people who declutter their, their houses or their offices. I'll be able to get good bargains on chairs, office tables. I didn't really need to have so much money to buy the brand new ones. And then also strategizing how you spend, like he said. Uh, for me, what I do at, uh, in my business every month, like I save money every week. Like I put out some money every week. Or there was a time I was doing it like every day. So I call that money like I, I, I keep that money in a separate account. What that money does for me is every month I map out, okay, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy that. I'm going to buy uh, an equipment. I do, I also do that for my uh, laboratory section because sometimes you might not have the funds to buy things at once. So from that account, I bring out money. I say, okay, I'm going to buy, for example, a microscope this month. 
the next month I'm going to buy this, or if I don't have up to that amount, it goes down to the next two months. So gradually you are getting little, little things to build up your practice. And uh, even, even when I moved into uh, my location uh, where I was, I, I did not like putting everything at once. I would just move in with the basic stuff. And then by the time you come the next month, you see that, okay, there's the AC. You come the next month, I bought another thing. You know, that was how I was doing. Like, I didn't really have those funds to just put in because nobody was giving me money to, you know. So if you plan it, just have an account. You can do every day, just similar to what you have with your jaw. You can use Piggy Vest. And then in your account, the money that comes into your account, Piggy Vest just automatically deducts it and saves it in an account for you. So you can use it to uh, acquire things. It's very good when clients come into your practice and see that there's always a new development because some clients also say it when they come here, they say, oh, the you people are always doing something. There's always, so sometimes it will be that the money I have saved up, I use it to change the shelves to something uh, better, or sometimes I use it to change, you know, there's just always something new that they see. Because if you just keep being static, you it's it's in in the minds of the consumers let let just be unpredictable let them just come in and see that you know you are improving your practice so just whatever amount you have just just try to uh save and then gradually buy those things you don't have to have that exact money at once okay thank you. uh dr chinasa thank you so much uh so just keep just be unpredictable every day people wake up you have something new up your shelf uh, your sleeve, sorry. So that's another one. So this question will go to Dr. Abimbola Oshi. And somebody is asking that, would you recommend starting a veterinary business, say a clinic or laboratory service immediately after graduation? Or is it advisable to go with the popular saying uh, that says um, staying under a clinician for a while for more exposure and experience? Yeah, like yeah I got you. that. So the question is, do, do I recommend starting your business um, immediately you graduate or, or staying? I think it all depends on you. So, so it depends on you. That's why if you go through um, my lecture, what I said is, first of all, you have to have a plan. Okay, your plan, number one, will determine whether you think you're ready or you're not ready. Number two, uh, Dr. Ghani said that back in those days, there was not that many mentors available. I'm sure he was the first private practice in yeah. wherever he was. I don't know where, well, I think it was Quara. So he must have been because in those days, there was just no mentor. And so they are the, um, how do I call it? They are the founders, the founding fathers, if you can, if you can put it that way. We are lucky that we have people who can mentor us and therefore increase the chances that we're going to be successful. So it's just increasing the chances, just listening to a lecture like this, listening to Dr. Chinasa, listening to Dr. Enahoro, I'm seeing a lot of the qualities that I talked about that you need to have as an entrepreneur. You need to love knowledge, you know, everybody. So if you are somebody who thinks, oh, I'm just gonna take a shortcut, and I just want to be like um, Dr. Chinasa or Dr. Ghani, you need to go and figure out how they got to where they are. So having a mentor when they're available helps. In this day and age, I would think that you need that unless you are extremely talented and um, you are also extremely lucky. But we don't believe in luck, you know. Uh, we always believe that you have to prepare. So it takes a while to prepare yourself to know the market, to know your trade, to know what you can offer, to understand what other people are already doing. There's already 200 other uh, small animal practices. Yeah. What are you going to do that's different? Because they, you are all going to compete in the market. You, you may never even take off. You can say, oh, I want to be like Dr. Chinas and open something next to her. And nobody comes to your place. Uh, it's because you've not thought about it. Is that position already occupied? Can mm -hmm. I find a way to do something different that you know will differentiate me and say, okay, she's known for this, but me, I'm known for this. And so everybody can exist. We can grow the market. 
So, uh, um, but going back to the same question, do I recommend it? Knowing my knowledge right now, I would say no. I think that you need to go out there. You need to develop yourself. You need to understand the market. You need to work on that people that, you know, that you can gain something. You can gain something either good or bad. You may work with somebody and realize how not to do stuff. You know, so, so I think it improves your chances of being successful. Can you do it? You can. But what is the best way to do it so you become successful? And I think getting a mentor, making sure you understand your trade, a day one veterinarian or veterinary surgeon really does not know too much. Everything you know is book. Now you have to welcome to the real world. Oh. And after being in the real world, you have to discover what you can contribute to that real world to make yourself a success. You need to write it down and you need to go for it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Abimbola. That's, I think that answers the question. So now that we have um, successful business around, we have mentors that are ready to carry us. Let me classify myself as a mentee too, to carry us under their wings. I think it's safe to say uh, you need this experience, especially we have to be as practical as possible. For us in Nigeria, we know our curriculum does not really encompass what it takes for you to come out single-handedly with that knowledge to learn a business. So let's try and be honest with ourselves and uh, make sure we get the right knowledge uh, before we embark on this journey called entrepreneurship. So somebody in the comment section, section is actually encouraging us as veterinarians to learn more about data analytics and animal health economics. Uh, they said this, this, these are highly helpful in agri-business agri and I will agree because um, I remember when I graduated, some of some, so, you know, they asked me to do a lot of things. And I vividly uh, can remember telling the person, I don't know anything other than just being a veterinary surgeon. I just want to job. I just want to do surgeries. And, and then, you know, um, but the world we are today, there is so much you can do. You need more to survive. Mm -hmm. You need more than um, knowing how, to, you, need, you need to think beyond just being a service provider in the sense, when I say service provider, you need to think beyond just, um, there is so much in the value. just say the question, the question goes to Dr. Chinasa. So I will direct it to you. Okay, uh, for the veterinary pharmacy, I think uh, from what I understand is that um, you can have, you can have an, 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 a, an outfit where you sell, depending on your location, where you sell uh, pet drugs, like for those who are into the poultry, on the small and um, the large animal practice. If you're around that area where you have people who have farms and all that, you can set up a veterinary pharmacy where you sell products. I don't really know about the profitability of that because what I run is a pet shop, which is also attached to the clinic. And I think pet shops also qualify as the veterinary pharmacy because we also sell uh, pet multivitamins and other products that's related to the pet health, apart from the accessories. For the pet shop, it is profitable because it, it's a business of numbers. So you have to, like what I said earlier, you have to understand what are the products that people buy. For example, I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day. I said that I went to her pet store and I realized that she had just a particular brand of dog shampoo. I think it was even a tea and flea shampoo. So I had to tell her that, no, don't force the customer to buy what you have. Make sure there's variety in Igbo language. Sorry, I'm going to speak Igbo. But you know, I grew up as a, you know, going to the shop and all that. My dad will tell you assorted guagua here. It means that assorted, having assorted uh, products is like the medicine to business. 
you don't force the you have to have if you have a shampoo shampoo if you sell shampoos sell the whitening shampoo sell the tick and flea shampoo sell the conditioning shampoo sell different things that's one of the things that most uh, high-end stores or uh, departmental stores like Shoprite and all have because people want to go to Shoprite and see different types of soap like you want to buy soap now you are seeing different types it gives you an option to choose so even in your veterinary pharmacy or your pet shop give them a variety of things they you find out that they end up picking more than what they bargained for not coming to your store and then you have just only one type of uh, of product that's not uh, too good then make sure that you you stock up it's Um, okay, I think uh, Dr. Chinas's network is um, not too good at the moment. Yeah, I can I can help her finish a little bit if I can. Okay, yes, please, yes, please. So, so the question also is about veterinary pharmacy and veterinary um, practice. One of the things I can say, and I've already seen it in Nigeria, but it's played out in England, it's played out in the U.S. and in a lot of places is that when it comes to pharmacy, you are going to start having the pharmacist fight with you over that, okay? Because what we traditionally do in veterinary medicine is that the way that we charge for our medicine, we sort of like rely on medicine for income. So somebody comes to you and they say, oh, my dog needs a deworming. So you will say, okay, I'm going to deworm your dog. And Instead, of, and what you do is you sell them the dewormer, but you mark it up, and that is how you make your money. And so the pharmacists, they are trained on their own side to handle drugs and sell it. They cannot diagnose the disease. They cannot write a prescription, although in some countries they are beginning, you know, on the human side, they are trying to make them write prescription because there's no doctors. But they cannot write prescription. They cannot make a diagnosis. But what they can do is get medicine, keep it, and supply it to people based on prescription. And so once the pharmacists start getting, um, um, when, once their own profession too, they're looking for work and things are getting tight, then they look and say, oh, the veterinarians have a lot of medicine too that we can sell. And therefore we can, they're also fighting for their profession. We can, we, can, we can get into this and make a lot of money and then there's a lot of fight. And anytime I was in England when it came there and I was in America when it came here, the veterinary profession always fights back and said, no, this is our veterinary uh, work. Unfortunately, the bad news is usually the pharmacists, they still are able to um, encroach into that business because they make their own case very well. The way that we countered it or the way that it is countered is this. Right now, we don't make a lot of money from drugs, unfortunately, because we have to be able to compete with the pharmacist. That's the only way to get it. You can go and buy it in the pharmacy or you can buy it in my store. Just compare the price. If it's $10 in the pharmacies, maybe I can sell it for $9.50. And that way you can compete with them. But the, way, the, one that, the one way they cannot compete with us is they cannot diagnose diseases. They cannot examine animals. So somebody comes in to get um, the warming. Normally I would charge them, let's say $100 and then give them the medicine and they, they will give it to me. Now, this is what, I, what we do. You have to register your pet. Maybe that's $50. You have to pay for the physical exam so that I can make the diagnosis, that's $50. And now you have to buy the medicine, that's $1. You know, so it, it's just, so it, it's just one of those things that I want to pass along once I hear the word pharmacy because I know a lot of people think there's a lot of money in there. There is, there is money in pharmacy, but it's a volume business. And that's why the pharmacists are trying to expand. But there's much more money in what you are trained to do, the unique abilities that you have to um, take a good history, do a physical examination, make a diagnosis and write a prescription. And if we value that very well, then the pharmacy is just a tiny part and we're not gonna be putting as much emphasis as we put on it right now. I hope that helps somebody, thanks. Yes, uh, thank you so much Dr. Abimbola for that um, answer. And somebody's, um, I think we're, we're going to start, it's, we've gone beyond, 
the time for the entire session, but we can still take uh, some uh, one more question and then other comments, and then we can take our hub expert recommendation uh, before we call it today. A few announcements here and there. Um, so this person is uh, is um, this question is for Dr. Ghani, and then this person is asking, what is the place of digital marketing in veterinary business? Uh, our current veterinary ethics says um, advertisement is unethical in the profession. Uh, Dr. Ghani. Yeah, um, advertisement is unethical in a business that is historic over the years and something we brought in from UK. Um, even in back here, we, there, are, there are clever ways, let me use that, to be able to seek for patronage without necessarily advertising. You can use your pet shop to call for uh, patronage through casual invitation but you cannot advertise your practice that, you know, your, your, the clinical aspect of your work. But there are quite a number of um, social media that exist today where you can, in the name of sharing knowledge, you can uh, find a way to allow people to know what you do, not necessarily by showcasing the, uh, the surgeries you have carried out in the practice, but you can uh, use social media. Um, quite a number of tools exist that uh, today's world makes, makes a big difference from what we used to do in the past. I think we need to begin to reduce some of the limitations that were inherited. In most human facilities today, you will see signboards saying that CT scan exists here, ultrasound scanning exists here, if they don't say so to the public, there is no way the public will know. So veterinarians must also begin to highlight areas of special interest to them. It's good for people to know that we have diagnostic activities going on in our practices, if we have them. So we need to actually review quite a lot of what used to be inhibitions of the past. I don't want you to say that, that that should be thrown back at me because the veterinary council have to take a lead in that. So when it comes to digitization, that is what is ruling the world for today and for tomorrow. We can't be behind. We need to begin to get ourselves to know quite a lot that we can benefit in the social media and in the digital world of today. I think that I will just stop at that. All right. Thank you very much, sir. And um, before we quickly... Um, we have some comments which I have read out and I would like to say, tell everyone we have about 201 participants in the room. So this has been a very uh, engaging um, session. Thank you to our hope expert. So this is um, another comment and I, I think looking at it will be very, very important. Like it will be very helpful where we get to talk about um, animal health business, uh, breaking it down to talking about market analysis, funding and accounting, um, marketing and branding, and then growth. Because these are things that we were not taught in school. You know, and then you want to be a businessman and you know nothing about business at all. So that's risky for you to, 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 to engage something you know nothing about. So we're going to look into this and possibly start up an, uh, like an animal health um, series where we get to talk about these things um, one after the other. Somebody also recommended that um, for our next sessions, we allow Dr. Uh, Abibola Oshi to um, break down those of those um, points in this presentation. And I would also like to tell people to please, this um, PDF, the, the presentation will be shared with you. Um, please, that particular picture, I've been staring at that picture since I saw it yesterday. So it has been doing something to my brain. Please get that picture and hang it somewhere in your office or in your shop, I uh, highly recommend that. Um, so thank you so much to all our hub experts. We're going to move to the next um, item on the agenda. Uh, like I stated earlier, we're going to have a post quiz, um, which is just going to be the same question we answered, but now we're going to see what we have learned after the presentation. So can we have- Dr. Tumsia, will you uh, allow the uh, hub expert to just give a summary of- uh, Oh yes, the hub expert recommendation. My apologies. Um, so we're going to be giving the hub experts uh, just two minutes.
to summarize. Has Nepa taken light in that place? All right, it, it, it looks like so. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we could just uh, and Rani start with you if you have a final word uh, to yeah. summarize. Despite there are a few questions I see here and there that has not been answered, but if you have a final word on uh, A to Z for business, what would that be to the people listening to you? First, I would uh, um, quote the statistic that was recently shared on many platforms that 12% of veterinarians have, in Nigeria have been employed by the civil service, the public service, leaving about 88% um, into the private practice. That means we have so many of us who are qualified to be in veterinary businesses and we need to be very mindful of this reality. Uh, for every opportunity we have, let us remember the ethics of business alongside the ethics of the profession that we have tra been trained to do. If we have any other person who is not a trained veterinarian practice veterinary medicine, we call them quacks. The same way, if we choose to do businesses without knowing the rules of businesses, we are also quacks in those areas. So that emphasizes the need for us to take time off. We are, as veterinary practitioners, we have time on our hands, especially the young vets. Have a lot of time in between clients that we can pick up courses, pay for them. Many of us don't want to pay for services, don't want to pay for services at all. We just want to continue to earn and put in our pockets. No, we will earn more money when we have some specialties, that will make us, I repeat the word, monopolist inside competition. So we should use those idle periods, so to speak, to develop ourselves in capacity and be semi-experts in those areas of businesses that we take for granted. At the end of the day, they add value to the very business of veterinary practice that we are engaged in. I think that's about what I have to say in two minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ghani, for your expertise and experience. Uh, Dr. Chinasa, I hope you're on now. All right, so maybe before she comes up, uh, Dr. Yes. Tumsia will also be up. Uh, but Dr. Abimbola Oshin, there are two questions I want you to quickly answer and then give us your final word, a brilliant presentation you have done today. How can we overcome our fear of starting? Starting can be so burdensome. And how can we balance family pressures? Your mom calling you, your father calling you, your friends calling you, something is happening. Somebody in the village is, uh, grandfather got pregnant. You know, there are stories <laughs> that touches the heart and yet you have a growing business in your hands. How can you balance both pressures? Then you can, of course, give us your final word. I believe before you're done, Dr. Tumsia will be up to take back the stage. Okay, so the first one is about fear of starting. So like everything, remember, uh, if you go back to the presentation, I talked about being an entrepreneur. Not everybody is cut out to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody. So an entrepreneur is somebody that, number one, knows how to take risks. It's not just really bad risk. You have to take calculated risk. Is somebody who is confident, you know, everybody says it is impossible and they say, watch me, you know, is somebody who has a vision, who can feel it, who can taste it, and who is confident and they have that goal, you know, that thing to go and get it. So it's not for everybody. Yes, it is, it is business. It is risky. A lot of, like I said, one in five businesses fail within the first one year. So I'm not going to diminish that. But then just like that too, like Dr. Ghani says, we really, really do have everything that we need to succeed. The only thing that we have to do is we need to get ourselves prepared for it. We need to find mentors. Those are the things that reduce the risk that makes it less fearful is if you prepare yourself, 
you go for you come to um you come somewhere like this get some more information go back learn about marketing learn about um about a market analysis learn about um, accounting you know how do businesses even work you know learn about the fact that you have income the fact that you have expenses learn the difference between an asset and an expense you know if dr china said um i listened to her lecture she gets money she puts it aside to invest back into the practice she's buying assets when you spend money on assets asset will bring you more money and then you spend money on assets it brings you more money you need to understand the difference between that and spending your money on expenses and the money has gone out and you're back in the same place so so it's all about knowledge you know um, I, there is one verse in the Bible that says, my, be, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. It's very pertinent to anybody. If you don't have knowledge, then it increases the risk and it increases the fear and the chances that you will not succeed. So, so we have to educate ourselves. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to find mentors. We have to study others. We have to invest in our own education. Those are the things that will reduce the risk. The second question is how do you balance family demands and your business? Yes. Now, I'm not sure which demand you're talking about. It could be demand of your time so you don't have enough time for your business. It could be demand for the resources of your business so the resources are not available for your business because they want it because they have all these stories that touch the heart. The only way that you can succeed doing that is to remember that your business is separate from yourself. Somebody said that earlier. I don't know which of the other contributors. I think it's Dr. Gani. Your business is an entity. That's why you have to register it. A business can be sued. A business is a person. And so you don't rob Peter to pay Paul. If you can get your business life different from your personal life, it's going to be easier. For me, I am in a partnership. So my business, I am very, very... Um, how do I call it? Um, I am, it's not really responsible, but um, there's the word I just forgot it. But you know, there's somebody, I'm accountable to my partner. So that helps me separate the business aspect from the personal aspect. The business money is not my money unless it is distributed to me as a, um, as, a as, as profit or distributed to me as my salary. If my business is already successful enough to pay me salary, and successful enough to give me profit. Before then, it is a business. And so that takes discipline. Another, um, another of the characteristics you need to have as an entrepreneur. So it takes discipline. Uh, and then your time, your, your business is like a baby. No matter if you need to give time to it, it's like having a farm. It's like having a child. You have to nurture it. So when people demand your time, you need to tell them, you're not gonna be hearing from me for a very long time. When I started my own business, um, I started a 24 hour practice and I didn't have enough money to employ somebody. So it was me and my partner. And we used to work a minimum of 12 hours a day, seven days a week, because we're 24 hours all the time. Until we got to the point where we were able to have enough money to get another doctor to work the night and then get another doctor to work the weekend, then get another doctor to work during the week. So, but, but during that time, I had no time for everybody, no time for wife, no time for kids, because that business had to be nurtured and had to succeed. So, so if you have that mentality, which are all mentality you need to develop as an entrepreneur, I think you'll be able to manage it. Not everybody will like it. You just have to apologize to them that I'm sorry, I don't have time for the party. Thank God it's your wedding, but I'm not going to be there because my business at this point needs me more than I, 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 I'll make it up to you in the future when I succeed. I hope that answers all that question. Yes, of course it does. Your final comments. Uh, Dr. Tumse, are you back? Yes, Dr. Femi, I'm right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. My final comment is, I mean, this is very commendable. I do appreciate the fact that, <clears throat> you know, veterinary, veterinary profession is actually the best small business in the world. I mean, um, it has been proven out here in the U.S. that 
it is one of the most desirable business to start. It has one of the lowest failure rates of all business. You know, it is recession proof. Even in the recession, people still have to people still have to take care of the health of their animals. They have to eat. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, they have to they have to engage the veterinary profession. So I when you go into more developed countries, you'll find that a majority of veterinarians are actually employed, not by the government, not by NGOs, not by um, uh, non-profit organizations, but by private businesses that are established by other um, veterinarians. And a lot of veterinarians, when they are done, at some point, Dr. Ghani is going to retire. I don't think he's gonna be in that practice until he's 110 years old, which is how long he's going to live for. So he, there should be other people that can then take over the practice, buy it from him, pay him over time and keep it going. So we're going to get to that point where people are going to start retiring, people are going to start selling their practices. Uh, sometimes it's better to buy somebody's practice and pay them out over time than for you to start from scratch. So, so Dr. Ghani, whenever you're ready to sell, um, be ready to advertise. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Abimbola. And um, he said some things. I just hope everybody can apply it. He said, no time for wife, no time for kids. I'm a wife and I did not, ah, no, 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 no. Anyways, um, let's allow sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> uh, Dr. Chinasa, can you um, come on for just um, two minutes and um, give us your recommendation on this particular topic? Dr. Chinasa. sir. Okay, uh, my, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Love okay, that. so my recommendation is that uh, you need to have, okay, so you need to have the clear mission and vision. So that helps you, it helps guide you in your practice. You know what you're looking out for. You know what you want to be in the next 10, 15 and 20 years. So your, your mission or vision should be clear cut. You need to have integrity because that's a very, very, very key component. People need to, as a vet, your word is your bond. So if, if, if you give your word on something, you need to actually follow through. You need to have integrity in the area of finance too. I've had a couple of incidences where, okay, let, let me use, for example, there was a, a day where a client uh, paid more than what she was supposed to pay mistakenly. And then when we found out, I told my staff, you guys know how we do it here. You don't take a client's money. You, you, have, you have to, we have to find a way to, because she was just a walk-in customer and then she mistakenly paid higher than what she was supposed to pay, which is in hundreds of thousands, more than what she was supposed to pay. So we had to find a way to get the customer uh, we had to put word out there because we didn't have, we only saw her through the CCTV. We don't have the contact. We didn't, but after like a week or two, we were able to uh, trace her and then she came back for her funds. So what I'm trying to say is we could have probably just taken that money and then there was no way she would have uh, uh, noticed or anything, but we had to trace her. So it's very, very good that you show a very high sense of integrity as a practice. Uh, as a vet, let your word be your bond. Then also, the importance of learning cannot be overemphasized. Even if you don't have enough money, like I said earlier, there are courses on Instagram, uh, you can pay for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, no matter how it is, no matter how, just learn. If it is on marketing, if it is on social media, if it's to run sponsored ads, if it's to, uh, like for me currently, I'm taking a course on structure, business structure, because I want to make sure that I, I put a lot of structure on my business because I have a problem of, I, I know I have a personal problem of delegating. So I'm working on it because I feel that nobody might be able to do it more than me. So I end up doing a lot of things that I'm supposed to leave out for my staff to do. So right now I'm in a learning process, trying to learn how to leave out those things to allow them make mistakes. 
and then uh, find a way to, to lay back and watch and see how the business runs. Then I've talked about growing your knowledge. Then the social media, uh, the vet practice uh, uh, states that we shouldn't advertise our business, but you can leverage on social media to advertise your practice. Not, not really advertising, but you could tell stories. Like for us, we tell stories uh, in the posts that we make. And in those stories, you know, you're able to tell the client that this is this. Okay, maybe where you make a video of a pet coming in, the pet is sick, and then you took the blood sample, and then you ran some tests, and then the pet is fine, and the pet has been discharged. That's like uh, it just something very entertaining because people come on social media to entertain themselves. So you make, you pass out the message, but in a subtle note, you're not saying that, oh, I'm the best vet clinic in town. You have to patronize me. No, just you show what you're doing in your day-to-day -day activities in, in a very entertaining manner. Then also make sure that you can be found. And when I mean you can be found, you can be found on social media. Even as a vet starting out, make sure your number is like for me, many years, my number was on Google, my business. So I started out uh, a grooming practice before I started vet lane. So I was going from house to house to groom people's dogs. The name of my business uh, then was Sparkling Falls Animal Care Limited. So I would go to people's house, but my number was online. So when people search how to, I want to groom my dog in Abuja, your number should that my number would pop out. So it's the same in the vet practice. If people search veterinary doctor in, for example, Garki, you sh your practice should be able to, you know, pop up because that's the way, uh, gone are the days where the normal brick and mortar way of adverts, like the flyers, the posters, those things don't work anymore. Like I was telling someone the other day, flyers and those people, like some people, even my estate, and I'm driving through the estate that they give me flyers. I sometimes I don't pay attention to it because the world has shifted to a digital age. The world has shifted to the age of social media. So if people are looking for anything, if people are looking for anything, they do it on social media. So uh, you can get anything, even when you want to organize a party or you want to do anything, you can get everything you need to do on social media. So leverage on that to make sure you put your practice on Google My, my Business on Google My uh, Business so that people can find you. So uh, I think that's basically all I want to say. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chinasa, thank you so much. And I hope we've all been able to take down this point from our three hub experts today. Um, we just need to push ourselves. Um, we need to do the right thing. There is no two ways about it. You want to do something, you have to come all out to do it. And when I mean coming all out is getting the necessary tools, the knowledge, the capacity. You, you, know, you, 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 know, you know when you can do something and you know when you cannot. So make sure you prepare yourself because we keep praying and hoping for something big. But the question is, are you ready for when that big thing arrives? So please make sure you prepare yourself. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the Hub Experts recommendation. Um, quickly, we'll take the post quiz for another three minutes, some announcement, and then we can call it a day. Can we have the poll up, please? Thank you. Yes. Okay, um, we can start answering the questions. We'll have it up for the next three minutes. Um, I can see the, okay, yes, now it's going. Uh, thank you. Keep the answers coming, as I stated earlier, for those who joined um, after we took the pre-quiz. So this is um, basically a way to help us um, um, gauge knowledge uh, shared and gain. So we take, a, a quiz before the presentation and after the presentation. So this is the post quiz, same question, answered at different times. So basically that's the difference. Thank you, keep your answers coming. We have 15% participation. Just have it up for the next um, two minutes, one minute, uh, 
yeah, one minute is gone. Uh, we have two more minutes to go. Keep it coming. I implore you all to please answer. It's based on anonymity. Your name is not going to show. Nobody's going to grade you. Nobody's going to come after you. <laughs> so please. Uh, thank you. We have about 36% participation. We can do more. Thank you. We have about a uh, minute 30 seconds to go before we take down the whole quiz. Um, 54%. We can do more. We had about 70%. Um, um, you can also take the post quiz even uh, even uh, even though you joined late, so it's not like they're not. It's not the pre quiz is not a prerequisite for the post quiz, so you can also take the post quiz even though you joined late. So please um, do that. Thank you. Uh, we have just about thirty seconds to go. Just one hundred and nine people out of almost two hundred people. We can do better, my people. Answer the questions. Thank you. We have just a few seconds to go. 65%, 66%. Can we get it up to 70% at least? You have the questions up on your screen. So you can also take the question even though you did not take the pre-quiz. It's not a prerequisite that. Okay, yes, 69%. And um, okay, yes, now we have 70% participation, which is good. Um, where, yeah, it's three minutes, so we can take down the poll results and um, the poll quiz and move to the next item on the agenda quickly, and we can call it a day. So, can we? Thank you very much. Can we have the slide back up? Hello, can you hear me? Um, okay, uh, thank you so much once again. I cannot keep, I cannot stop thanking everyone for coming. It's been way, um, over one hour, I think we're just a minute away from two hours. I did not realize time had gone so fast. Um, so we have just some few announcements for you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we now serve as a service um, continuing education provider to the veterinary council. Um, recently, the council has um, stated that you need 18 points. Um, organized by the council and other approved um, continuing education providers for you to earn points so you can get your license renewed. So we are we have been approved by the council as a continuing education provider. Um, next slide, please. So this session is free. Everyone can join, but um, a token of 2,750 is needed to have your VCN accredited certificate and names submitted to the council for your points. So these are just the simple steps. You can take a note of this um, account number, make a payment into Farm Alert Echo, um, Providence Bank, using your VCN number in the description. And then you can send a message to me. This is my number on the screen, Dr. Timsia, for verification and your certificate. Um, next slide, please. Yes, this is also a big one. Uh, the Farm Alert Wholesale was launched sometime in April, and we're supporting veterinary businesses with logistics and distribution. Uh, we're giving you convenience at zero cost. So we have a number on the screen and an email address you can contact for uh, your supplies of um, veterinary accessories, pet food, and the likes of, uh, the likes of it. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
Um, yes, and then the Farmer Land Radio. Uh, we have, we've, we've been uh, on this journey for the past um, three months. And I would say for now we have over, we have 100,000 100, listening in. So that's an audience for you to want to talk to. So you can join our team as a volunteer. You can create a special program in and around animal health, ranging from zoonoses, um, uh, one health, animal welfare, animal diseases, disease um, surveillance and diagnosis, anything in and around animal health you want to share with the public. Um, you're welcome to contact us, send us an email uh, with your idea and then we can make it a reality. Uh, so next slide, please. So talking about business, um, this is an easy way for you to run your business. So the veterinary business management software is here to automate your sales, track your inventories, analyze your cash and debts and transfers, and also to know your numbers. So you can call the number on the screen for further information. So you need to leverage technology to manage your veterinary business. And there is a sales going on. There is literally uh, more than 50% slash of the original price. So you have to do your business right. You have to be on top of your game. Thank you so much. And um, next slide, please. Yes, so um, this, the chat box is available. What other topics would you want us to address in our subsequent sessions? Um, you can drop, uh, you can drop your suggestions and um, topics in the chat box. We'll extract them and make sure we make informed decisions for our subsequent sessions. Thank you very much. We can do this for the next two minutes and then we can call it a day. Once again, thank you so much everyone for joining to our Hub Experts. It has been an amazing, uh, it has been an amazing, amazing session for me and for everyone on board. You can also follow us on all our social media platforms, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. You just simply search Famalat and we're right here. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you everyone. Have a nice day. Dr. Tumsia, you didn't heartily thank all our hub, uh, experts. Uh, so let me uh, finally thank uh, Dr. No, B. sir, uh, I actually did that. Okay, so, all right. Okay, then. you can do it again. It's never all too right. much. Thank you so you much, uh, you can Dr. Austin. Thank you very much. I think I can unmute everybody. Uh, so that people can unmute and say thank you to our resource persons, Dr. Mbimbola, uh, Dr. Ghani Nahoro, and then, of course, uh, uh, the wonderful Dr. Chinanta. Thank you so much. <laughs> I also thought uh, you could have asked them to on their video for your record. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mbimbola. I need to have you, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is especially Dr. Ghani. I just recently finished serving him. Ghani has been a source of encouragement, especially when I Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm coming. Yes. Yeah, I think we will need the account detail to make payment and the phone number to call. Please, if you can get us email or WhatsApp. Thank you. 
Yes. So you can call Dr. Nancy for any of our products. Is it for the Echo, uh, uh, for the software, for the whole series? Dr. Nancy will be, the number is on the chat box. You can just send that message to you. No, I mean for the certificate of participation. Yep. Um, Dr. For Nancy, Dr. Dr. Cynthia, any one of them will help. They will help Thanks, one of our products. Yes, I'm good now, I'm happy. Okay, so yeah, I can give their phone number, please. The phone number is on the chat, and you can read it uh, out to the phone. All right. Tumsiat's number, the chat, and then of course the account details. Yes. <laughs> 